Okay, it's time to get started, so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, tonight again as we come together to look at your word, I pray, Lord, you will anoint this time together. Anoint your word as it goes out. Anoint my lips to speak those things that you would have. And anoint our hearts to receive those things <clears throat> that you would have for us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, tonight we're going to start the period five uh, in the life of Christ. And this is the Judean ministry. Now, you remember he's been in Galilee uh, ministering there, healing, training his disciples and going through all of that up in Galilee. Now it's time for him to move down into Judea. And so we start off here, and this is kind of interesting because there's John who has been relatively quiet as far as uh, up until now. We don't see a whole lot from John of what was going on in these first four periods. But now John kind of takes over in period five, and we get most of our information from him. So it's just kind of an interesting change. But it also should tell us something, and that is uh, John uh, being the revelator, being knowing what he knew before he wrote his gospel we can kind of take a clue that we're going to be seeing some more spiritual things, or at least uh, uh, the, the actions of Jesus during this period of time will have more significance uh, on the spiritual and prophetic world uh, than maybe we have seen in the first four. And maybe, maybe that's why we see John picking this up. But we start off here in John chapter 7, verses 2 through 9. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go on, uh, you go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Now, the, the first thing we notice here, this was the Feast of Tabernacles. And the feasts have always, to some people, are always kind of a, you know, which feast is this and what do they do during this feast? And I think it's important we understand a little bit about this feast. It's the Feast of Sukkot, or Sukkot. Uh, and in traditional, um, uh, well, the traditional Askanazi pronunciation, I mean, is Sukkot's. Anyway, it literally means the Feast of Booths is commonly translated to English as Feast of Tabernacles, sometimes also as Feast of the Ingathering. It is a biblical Jewish holiday celebrated on the 15th day of the month of Teshri. Now this varies from year to year. Sometimes it's in October uh, and sometimes it's in September. So it's late September to early October. During the existence of the Jerusalem Temple, it was one of the three pilgrimage festivals uh, on which the Israelites were commanded to perform a pilgrimage to the Temple. So there are three of them, Passover being one, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles being another, and I believe the Feast of Pentecost was the third. And so they were supposed to come to Jerusalem during that period of time, during that festival, uh, to take part in the festivities. Now, Sukkot has a double significance. Now, the one mentioned in the book of Exodus is agricultural in nature. It's called the Feast of Ingathering at the Year's End. Now, this is Exodus chapter 34 and verse 22. And what it does, it marks the end of the harvest time, 
and thus of the agricultural year in the land of Israel. The more elaborate religious significance from the book of Leviticus is that of commemorating the exodus and the dependence of the people of Israel on the will of God. Exodus 23, 42-43. Now the holiday lasts seven days in Israel and eight days in Dispersia. Now what it means by that? Um, I'm going to stop right here and kind of explain some things. In Israel, they didn't have cell phones. And in Jesus' day, they didn't have texting, they didn't have TV, radio, or anything like that. And the exact date of the festival was established by the Sanhedrin. And they used their, uh, we would call it scientific abilities, to figure out exactly the day that the festival was supposed to start. So, and they never let that no, be known until just a matter of a week or two before the start of festival, they would give the exact day that it was to start on. All right? So what they would do is they would send out messengers from Jerusalem and they would go out into what's called Dispersia. Dispersia were all the Jews that were scattered throughout all the regions, which would be Galilee, for instance. A messenger would go into Galilee and say, okay, the festival of Tabernacles starts next Wednesday, or a week from Wednesday, or however length of time it gave. Well, that was fine for Galilee, but what if there was a Jew, bunch of Jews that were clear over by Nineveh, which took 30 days to get there? Mm -hmm. you see? And so this all had to be figured in the length of time it would take to get the messengers out and get them back and you know, for the people to get there in time for the festival. So what they did is they added one day to the festival for all of those who were in Dispersia. So you had an extra day so, to get there so you could still have seven full days. And that was their reasoning uh, why you had seven days in Jerusalem. If you were in Jerusalem, started on this day, ended on day seven. If you were from someplace else, it started here and ended on the eighth day. So that's, that's the, the explanation of how that worked. The first day <clears throat> and second day in the Dispersia. So in other words, it was first day for, for uh, Jerusalem, second day for anybody else coming in. So you had that extra day grace. Um, is a Shabbat-like holiday when work is forbidden. So it was like the Sabbath. They could not work. And they, they couldn't travel, but only a short distance. You know, all of those uh, rules for the Sabbath applied to the first day, if you were in Jerusalem, second day, if you were from outside, uh, of this festival. Now, the first place, this was a festival. This was not a uh, down on the wool, uh, you know, well, we got to walk around all somber face. This was a festival. I mean, they got with it. This was a you know, you see a picture sometimes, you see them dance in the hora, 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 dance with it, the circle dance, you know, in there. You've seen in the movies and stuff, you know, they're all, that was the kind of things they did. This was where some of that started. And it was actually a festival time. It was a time of feasting, of uh, fellowship, and just having a great time, kind of like we do in Christmas. That was very similar to that. Uh, and so they had a great time. Um, now, <clears throat> This is followed, so they have the first day is the Sabbath. And by the way, Sabbath was not a down day. You know, we think oftentimes we kind of think the Sabbath was a time when they kind of walked around real somber face. It was a time when they were supposed to have fun. Uh, when they, they didn't work, they didn't go to work, and the idea was you were supposed to be with your family and you were supposed to have fun. So they often had big feasts, they had friends over, uh, and, and, and our other family members more than friends. And, and they just they had a celebration every Sabbath. So it wasn't a time of somberness. It was a time of, of having a great time. And so this is how they started their Feast of Tabernacles. Um, now this is followed by days called the Korahamod, 
when certain work is permitted. So during the festival days, you could do certain amount of work, certain things. Certain things you, of course, could not do. Now the festival is closed with another Sabbath, or Sabbat, like holiday, and that's called the Shemani Atzeret. Again, one day in Israel, two days on the disparative. Where the second day is called Shimchat Torah. Okay? Uh, now this last day, whether it was in Dysphoria or in Jerusalem, was called the great day of the feast. And we find that mentioned in John chapter 7, verse 3, and Numbers 29, 35. <clears throat> the Hebrew word Sukkot is the plural of Sukkah, which means booth or tabernacle. And it's a walled structure covered with shkash, which is a plant material such as overgrowth, uh, palm leaves. Around here, we probably grab fir boughs, you know, whatever we could find. And that was the roof that was put over these booths. Um, now, Sukkah is the name of the temporary dwelling in which farmers would live during harvesting. It's a fact connected to, uh, to the agricultural significance of the holiday stressed by the book of, Ex of Exodus. As stated in Leviticus, it is also intended as a reminiscent of the type of fragile dwellings in which the Israelites dwelt during their 40 years of travel in the desert after the exodus of slavery in Egypt. Throughout the holiday, meals are eaten inside the sukkah and many people sleep there as well. Now, if I can get this guy to cooperate with me here. I have some pictures uh, of some sukkah. I guess it's not going to cooperate with me again. Anyway, I had some pictures. <laughs> Technology. What they do, they, they actually build these little booths, and, and they're made out of all kinds of things. Uh, they're just, some of them are just four, four buys and two buys with tent material hanging down. Others are more elaborate. Some people, uh, they actually built them, it looked like on their patio or wherever, you know, you see all this stuff, and they just enclosed them. And, that was their, their booth. Other, another one I had a picture of was kind of it was kind of cute. It was a sukkah sitting all by itself, and there's plastic chairs and an arc around the fireplace. You don't run around a campfire, so it was like out in the. This is the way, but this is the way that they they stayed uh, during harvest time. So instead of leaving the fields, going all the way back home into town, <clears throat> then having to get up early and come all the way back out, they just stayed there until the harvest was completed, which made perfectly good sense. Now in the spiritual significance of that, here you had the end of the, of the growing season, and this was harvest. This was the time to reach out and see all of the, all of the fruits of your labor. And uh, when you think about Jesus, what did he come for? He said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He also said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, he would send forth laborers into his harvest. What he was signaling was, this was the time of harvest. This was the time when mankind, who had been growing, struggling through all the ages, was going to come to a point to where they could suddenly become saved. Now remember, we're not thinking in terms of years here, we're term, thinking in terms of centuries. So the coming of Jesus Christ and his death, his resurrection, these are all tied to the idea of harvest. Everything that went on, now it's harvest time. Now it's time to get people together. And, and so uh, this was a very, very important uh, festival in the idea of ingathering. Now on the other side of the coin, which was the, the idea of the 
uh, people in the wilderness, they built structures, while they were probably more out of skins, they were still temporary. They were just put up, took down, flimsy, you know, they didn't really, they were not permanent, they were just traveling through. And again, here we have a very, I think, clear uh, example of Jesus, because he was temporary here. He never intended to stay here very long. 30 years, he knew, his, he knew how long he was going to be here. And it was for a, the express purpose of taking people from here and bringing them to here. He, if you will, he bridged the gap between the physical religion of Judaism and the spiritual religion of the church. So it was Christ who was, if you will, taking us or taking humanity through the wilderness. If, you, if you're catching what I'm talking about. And so this Feast of Tabernacles was a time that looked back on the harvesting, back on being out, taken out of Egypt, but it also looked forward to the harvest of souls, the individuals being able to actually as individuals find Jesus or find God or, or be able to touch God and also that that idea of moving from point A to point B to get there. So <clears throat> it was a very important uh, very important uh, feast. So everyone was was supposed to be there. Now also during this time it was mandatory to perform a waving ceremony with four spices and you can look that up, but they took these four spices and they would put them together and they had to wave this before the Lord. It was part of what they did. Alright, so here we have Jesus and he is uh, he's in still in Galilee and he's getting ready to go or, or, or he knows it's about time to go to the harvest or to the festival because it was at a hand and here come his brother. Now, they had to figure how much time it was going to take to get there. And they had to, had to figure all of that out, how long, you know. And here come his brothers. And this would be the brothers of Jesus. These were not brothers in the sense that we use brothers in the church. These were his, his brothers, his half-brothers. And we know who they are because they're named in Matthew, and that would be James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Not Judas Iscariot, but the other Judas. These were his half-brothers. And they wanted him to get ready to go to the feast. Um, and uh, you, you have, to, have to kind of picture this. When they got ready to go to Jerusalem for these feasts, they didn't just hop in the car and go. They all got together and they formed a caravan. And it would be usually, if you had a big family, you might just take your family. If you, had, if you didn't have a really large family going, then you would include your neighbors. Sometimes it was a village, would all get together and go at the same time. So they would form these caravans, and then they would head to Jerusalem. Now the distance, uh, depending on how they went, was someplace between 50 and 80 miles. Could be as much as 100 miles. But it wasn't something you were going to do in one day. Uh, you know, the, they didn't have Cadillacs. Lincoln's then. So it took a while for that poor little donkey and the camel or whatever they had or their feet to get them there. <coughs> and so they, would, they knew how many days it would take. And they would all get together and then on a set day they would all leave together. And so this is, this is what they, the brothers of Jesus came to him and they said, okay, uh, you know, it's time for uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So you need to go. Now, Jesus had not been to Jerusalem for 18 months, so he had already missed other three festivals that he was supposed to attend. He didn't make it. And so they, they basically were telling him, look, you need to go to Jerusalem. But notice the reason why they wanted him to go. They said, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Now, if we just looked at that, we might assume that these men were sincere in saying, you know, you need to go so that your disciples, your followers, not the disciples, not the twelve, not those in Galilee that had been with him in Galilee, but those that believed in him that were in Jerusalem. 
the followers that were there. They need to see what you're doing. They need to see these miracles. They need to hear what you're saying. And that would sound like a good idea until you read the next verse. And what's the next verse say? <laughs> For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. In other words, for, you want to be known. You've got all these crowds up here in Galilee. And there's kind of an, a backhanded uh, statement here. Because remember, Galilee was not the prominent Jewish area. This was the other side of the tracks. You went to Judah if you wanted to be with the true Jews. You know, the influential ones, the ones that would really get you where you wanted to go. You needed to be in Judah. Because over there in Galilee, you know, that's where Nazareth was. Does any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, that was kind of the way they looked at all of Galilee. And, and, and when you look at a map, and, and well, I'll show it to you, I get this stupid thing to work. But, um, it pulled it up. Hmm? It did pull it up. It did? Uh-huh, oh. it did. So if you go back, it, it shows the map. Let me see if I can get this thing up. I don't know if I can get it to come up. Um, Because it back, if you back up, it that's where it shows the maps. Well, it's frozen is my problem. It doesn't want to do anything. There we go. Try it one more time here. Yeah, it, was, it showed the maps All right. right there. Well, that isn't the map I wanted, but mm. this thing keeps wanting to go back to the lesson 28. I don't know what's so <laughs> important about lesson 28. You'll see, you know, you've got Judah down here, you've got Galilee up here, and right smack in the middle is Samaria. Samaria, uh, you know, the Jews hated the Samaritans. And, and so you automatically had this wall between Galilee and Judah, and it's called Samaria. Commerce had to go around it because it wouldn't go through it. Uh, and then you also had suspicions. I imagine those Sumerians have been going up there and, and uh, you know, messing around in Galilee, and so we've got people that have mixed ideas. Um, can't load the file. Oh, that's interesting. How come you can't load the file? Anyway, here's, this will kind of give you a little idea anyway. Down here is Judah. And so he had, Jesus has been up here. Here's Jezreel, Nahum. Tiberius, here's Capernaum, this is primarily where he was, here's Nazareth, so on. So when we open up tonight, he was probably in Nazareth because his brothers were there, so he probably had gone back to Nazareth to his home. Uh, <clears throat> and so they're going to make the trip down here. Now, the way the rest of them would have gone was they would have taken off and gone this way, crossed over the Jordan River, come down the west bank, of the Jordan River, and then down here, after they got past Samaria, they would cross back over into Judah. And they say, that doesn't make sense. I mean, why didn't you just come this way? They would not go through Samaria. Devout Jews would not go through there. So, here they are, getting ready to make their trip, planning how long it was going to take. And here's his half-brothers, and they're telling him, look, if you don't go to Judah, you're never going to have a name. You're never going to be, a, you know, like what you want. In other words, you just want a lot of attention. You want to be somebody. And that's what they were saying. And if you read the next verse down here, it says, For even his brothers did not believe in him. They were not encouraging him in his ministry. 
they were saying, look, you're going around doing all this stuff. We don't even know that you're doing anything other than some conjuring. Maybe you're a magician. Maybe somewhere you learn to do trickery and you're deceiving the people. And you just want to be somebody. Well, if you want to be somebody, you need to go down to Judah where you can really be a somebody. That was the attitude that these guys were throwing at Jesus. And how often do we see that? When you find Christians that are successful in something, somebody always wants to come along and throw stones at them. Well, you're just doing it for that. You're just doing it for that. You don't yak, 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 yak. Well, if that person's going to be here, I'm leaving. What? They probably wanted to be part of his fame through the relationship they had to him. But they did not believe in him. In other words, if he goes to Judah, he'll be rich. Man, we get to get some of that. Now here's the problem. They made the assumption that Jesus was seeking notoriety, which they would have done, they would have done, and since Jesus was on, you know, Galilee rather, or Judah rather, was on the other side of the tracks from Galilee, in other words, it was the influential, influential part, Jesus should go there. If he was really doing miracles, the world would see him in Jerusalem, since it was the capital of Judah and one of the crossroads for trade. Makes sense? Yeah. But they were looking at it through their own eyes. And haven't we seen that all the way through our study of the Gospels? The Jews were always looking at it through their own eyes. Always on the outside. Always judgmental. Always trying to do things just so. so and it was always so they could get ahead. And this was the very thing that Jesus had been talking about. You know, it's interesting that those who are closest to us do not always believe us. Sometimes it's harder to make your kids, your parents, other people, other family members believe that you've actually done something, made a change, or that what you're talking about is real. Maybe it's because they know us too well, I don't know. But notice what Jesus replied. He said that his time... Now, this was his time to go to the feast. Now, I've heard preachers talk, use this scripture. His time had not come. It wasn't time for him to die. No, that wasn't the subject he was talking about here. His time to go to the feast had not come. And, and, and so, uh, they were free to leave whenever they pleased. He said here, um, then Jesus, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. In other words, I can't leave yet, but you can. You have freedom to go. I can't leave yet. Now, he wasn't talking about waiting a year, two years, six months, or even a week. But he did, and his point here was, my time, I'm not going to go with the caravans. I'm not going to make that trip with everybody else. And we can surmise, we can make some assumptions uh, based on what we're going to see here in a minute, but it's quite possible that Jesus did not want to travel with the caravans because he would become very conspicuous. I mean, you can see the caravan moving along, you know, here's two people leading along, and here's all the rest of the caravan around Jesus as they're walking down the road, and he's healing and he's preaching and he's and people are coming from everywhere and you know he's trying to get they're all trying to get to Jerusalem and if he was with them he'd slow them all down you know you can look at it from that point you can look at it from the point of view he didn't want to make a big deal about him coming because he knew the high priest and all of them were going to be waiting for him okay that's another uh, a point I, I don't subscribe to that one too much I don't think he was afraid of any of them uh, you know but there was some a specific reason that he did not want to go. 
at that time. So he told him to go ahead. You, know, you, you go ahead and go. But notice this. You can go whenever you're ready. And notice his, his reasoning. The world cannot hate you. But it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. In other words, you can go and nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to come against you. Nobody is going to, uh, you know, say anything or cause any disruption. You can go have a great time at the festival and just, you know, just celebrate and have a great time. And, and nobody is going to bother you. But if I go, they're going to hate me. They're going to come against me. They're going to cause trouble. I can't go, and, I, and I'm reading between the lines and kind of putting things together. I can't go and have a great festive, festive time because the world hates me. They're going to come against me. They're going to disrupt everything I do. I can't go with the idea of a festival. I'm going because I have to go. I'm doing my father's business. Same thing he said earlier when he went into the temple when he was 12 years old. Point here, uh, and, and of course that's that's I'm saying that's all my surmising. Um, but he also here was pointing out another fact that I think that's uh, we need to look at, and that was that since his brothers were part of the religious system that he preached against. The world, that's the Jewish leaders, did not care what they did. But since he taught against that system, they hated him and would seek to kill him. And we find that's exactly what happens. All right, so he, taught, he instructed his brothers to go to the feast, but he said he would come at a later time, and he stayed in Galilee. So his, his statement to them was, I, and, and then we can read that and say, well, he didn't intend on going, but then he changed his mind and went. No, he was just going to go at a later time. He wasn't going to go for the opening ceremonies and the, the opening Sabbath and all that. He would get there at some point. All right, second point here. Now we, we're going to look at uh, a little different. Uh, Jesus did something a little strange here for, for a Jew. And that is, <clears throat> he journeyed through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. This was different. Now, Jesus had done this before. I mean, this isn't the first time he'd been to Samaria. But this was, this was seemed to be, he, he didn't mind going into Samaria. And generally, the Samaritans didn't really have much of a feeling about the Jews. They could care less about the Jews. Uh, in fact, one of the parables Jesus taught was the Good Samaritan. It was the Samaritan who was willing to take care of the Jew. The Jews were not willing to even touch a Samaritan. And so we see here Jesus doing something unusual. Um, well, let's read it first. Then. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to start with Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. Luke is the only one who uh, covers this particular event. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and as they went they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Matthew he says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came <clears throat> to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. 
And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Mark 10 and 1. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. And finally, John chapter 7, verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Okay. <clears throat> so, you notice it said that Jesus got there on the other side of Jordan, which would have been the approved route. So, what he evidently did is, if you'll notice Samaria right here, comes right up to a point at the Sea of Galilee. And Samaria was bordered on by the Jordan River right here. This over here was Decapolis, this area over in here. So what, what he did was he evidently came across from up here, where, where is it, Capernaum, Nazareth, and came across this portion of Samaria and crossed then into the, the Jordan River. Either that or he came down by here this direction and crossed and then came over the Jordan River. However, it was convenient for him. But the point is, he evidently cut through Samaria and then over the Jordan River and came down the west side of the Jordan River. This was unusual. He didn't do that. Um, now, John uh, gives us a little insight, I think. He said that he left, it doesn't say he specifically went as in secret, but he said, what's the terms he used? Not openly, but as if, or as it were, in secret. In other words, he didn't let anybody know when he was leaving. He didn't get a bunch of people together. He didn't go in a caravan. It was him and the twelve, and they just took off. Now, what he did do was send some messengers ahead. Now, we don't know who these messengers were. <clears throat> Actually, in the original text, it says angels, but angels in the Hebrew means messengers. So, you know, that's, angels are not necessarily heavenly people or heavenly beings. They can be uh, just messengers. And, and so he sent these messengers ahead. Now, it could have been the, some of the 12 disciples. Because this is, wouldn't be the first time that he'd done it, and it wouldn't be the last time, when the disciples weren't ahead of him to make arrangements. And I would assume this is exactly what he did. He may have even sent James and John as the messengers, uh, with the messengers, to make those arrangements. Possibly Judas with them, since he was the keeper of the money. And so what they were doing was going ahead to arrange for a place to spend the night, and for meals, refreshments, and that sort of thing. But when they got there, um, <laughs> ah, gee, you know, they didn't accept them. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't allow him to be there. So this was an interesting, um, interesting situation. Now, he's waited in Jerusalem. He left secretly. Uh, to attend the feast. After all the pilgrims had left, he waited. And, and now you get anything from, most of them are saying probably three to four days. I don't really think he waited that long. It may have been a day or two days. And the reason I say that is because the pilgrims are moving along at a pretty good rate. You know, they're point A, point B, we can make 10 miles, we can make 50 miles today, or we can make 20 miles, whatever it is. Jesus, on the other hand, he's traveling, and when he takes off, we're going to find out in a minute, the multitudes are all around him, and it says he did what he always did. He stopped and taught and, and, and ministered and, and healed. And, and You're not going to make very many miles doing that in a day. And so his time to get there would have been a lot longer than the others. So he may have left the same day, or he may have left a day or two later. We're not told. Uh, now, but it was interesting also that, um, what does it say here, um, 
After he had finished his sayings, he, he departed. That, anyway, he set off. He had decided it was time to go, and so he set off. He set his mind to go to Jerusalem. And I think that... Um, It's a reference anyway, but I, it was in one of the concordances. But he resolutely set himself. He made up his mind. He's going to go to Jerusalem. So he took off. Um, so he's decided to cross the Jordan River beneath the, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, let me see where I'm at. I've got to find this. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, it's in Luke. I'm sorry. The beginning of Luke, it says, Now uh, it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he said, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. I wanted to point something out here. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. He was resolute in his determination to go to Jerusalem, and he was not going to allow anything to stop him from getting there. That's what steadfastness means, that term. So he steadfastly set his face to go there. Now the word here that's translated received up means literally to be uh, removed from a lower to a higher place. And comes from the root word which means to take up or to raise. Uh, and what I think is interesting here is that Jesus did not go to Jerusalem, didn't steadfastly set his mind to go to Jerusalem in order to be crucified. And you hear that all the time. You know, he was resolute in his determination to go and be crucified. No, not according to this. Now, he was resolute and steadfast, and that was part of it. But he was looking beyond the crucifixion to his, to the glory of his resurrection. Now, there's a lesson in this for us. Uh, you know, we're 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 faced with all kinds of trials, and we're faced with all kinds of things. And 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 the, even the apostle Paul, you know, if you if you're not careful, you read he says you you need to look forward. These things are going to happen, and you need to you know, glory in these things, and and you need to be happy in these trials and temptations and problems, you, you'd be happy in that. And we, if we just stop at that, we can say, how in the world can you be happy when you're going through this kind of a problem? How can Jesus possibly set his mind to go be crucified? The point is, the crucifixion was necessary. Our trials are necessary, but we shouldn't be happy in our trial or be happy in the fact, in Jesus, be happy in the crucifixion, but what we should be happy in is the result. When we set our minds at the glory, the reward that is ours, that's what we set our mind resolutely on. This is what it means by walking in faith, looking ahead at what we are going to gain. When we look at that, then all of these other things become much easier to endure because we have a hope, as the Apostle Paul said. Without the hope, we cannot endure. It just doesn't work. And so <clears throat> Jesus here, I think, is teaching you in just a simple statement here that Luke puts in here. I, I think it's the Holy Spirit, of course. But I think he's teaching us to look beyond what we see, beyond the immediate, at what we don't see, but we know is coming. Our reward. And that's what Jesus said. He had looked beyond that to his resurrection. The time for him to be received up was at hand. He couldn't get there till he first went through the crucifixion, but it was still at hand. All right. All right. So he he sent his messengers and uh, to make arrangements, and the Samaritan villagers uh, they didn't accept him. Now Samaritans usually received travelers, 
But, but the point here, I think, that kind of tells us what was going on is that they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. In other words, he was going to the festival. Why would they care that he was going to the festival? Because if you'll remember, Samaria was part of Israel. Uh, you had Judah and Israel. And you remember, Israel set up their own temples and their own holy cities under Jeroboam. And they mimicked everything that was going on in Jerusalem. So they had their own Feast of Tabernacles that took place in their holy cities in front of their own temples. And here comes a Jew who dares to come through our country on his way to Jerusalem to practice what he could do right here just as easy. Isn't that the logic that we see today? Well, you guys go to church and spend all your time. You can do it in front of a TV set. God loves you just the same. How often do you hear somebody, God knows my heart. <laughs> right? Yeah, he does. He knows your actions. He knows your heart. He knows all about you. So this is why they did not receive him. And notice the result here. James and John, who Jesus called the sons of thunder, <clears throat> <laughs> they they go need to go to Jesus. They said, Jesus, can, can we call fire down on heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? <laughs> Doesn't it sound like John the beloved? The, the loving disciple, John? <laughs> can we call fire down? <laughs> now they were probably referring to 2 Kings uh, chapter 1. And what happened is, and it just, it, this is a, a kind of a little-known Bible story. I mean, it, you don't hear it preached on very often. But King uh, as a, Isaiah, King Isaiah of Israel, had fallen through the lattice or wood woodwork that was in his upper chamber. Uh, that was all kinds of things of what this might mean. But he had an, all the rooms had an upper room. In this upper room, we talked about the upper room where they would go uh, to meditate, read, whatever. And he was in his upper room and he fell through the lattice work. Now this may have been a uh, wood covering over a, uh, like a trap door or an opening that went down into the house, whatever it was. He fell through it and was injured. And so <clears throat> what he did was he had his, uh, he sent his, servants or whatever, out to uh, <clears throat> Escalon to inquire of the god named Belzebub, which means Lord. And, and what he was asking about was, was he going to die of, these, of his injuries? Well, about the same time as the servants headed out to go ask this uh, god about that, uh, the god the real God spoke to Elijah. And he said, Elijah, <clears throat> uh, Azariah is sending these guys over to inquire of the God in Escalon. And I want you to meet him by the way. And what you're to say to him is this. Is there not a God in Israel that you have to go and inquire of a false idol? You go back and tell the king that because he has in, wanted to inquire of an idol, he is going to die. He's not going to get off his bed. So the guy turned around him and they, and they headed back into the city and they evidently hadn't gone very far. Elijah must not have been very far away from them. And they went back and the king said, what are you doing back here already? And they said, well, we met this guy by the road, and he, 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 this man, and he told us that because, you know, and he, they repeated, you know, and uh, he said that you're, you're going to die. And so the guy, what's this guy look like? And what I found was, and I hadn't noticed it, I guess, I probably had, but never, I just didn't remember it, but the description they gave of Elijah is the same description they gave to John the Baptist. He was... He's dressed in rough 
camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. That's exactly the way that they described John the Baptist. No wonder they thought he was Elijah. <clears throat> and, and the king said, ah, that's Elijah. So he called in a captain and he says, you take your men, 50 men, and you go bring Elijah to me. You go down and arrest him and bring him in here. That's what he's saying. So they went down there with the captain with his 50 men and they approached Elijah and they told Elijah, you're going to go into the king and Elijah just stepped back and called fire out of heaven and consumed them. So the king sent another captain with 50 more men down to arrest Elijah and the same thing happened. Fire out of heaven, consumed them. So the king got the third captain and says, you go down there with your men. So he takes off and goes down there. But this guy, when he gets there, he's got a little more sense than the other two. <clears throat> and so he gets there and he falls down on his face before Elijah. And he says, please don't kill us. You know, we're just the servants. You know, we're just here. Don't kill us. We're just the messengers. You know, that kind of that's the problem. And so Elijah got in God and told Elijah, you, you go on down and talk to the king. Don't worry about it. You just go on down and talk to the king. So he went on down to the king. And, and he told him, you know, the same story. You know, because you went off to seek advice of this idol, you're going to die. And he did. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. <clears throat> that was what these guys were referring to. And the reasoning was kind of the same. When Elijah is the prophet, and these, this king insists on going to a false idol, and insists on thinking that false idol had more power than Elijah, or the God of Elijah. And here's these Samaritans who think their worship has more power than Jesus Christ has. You see that, you know, I mean, they've been with Jesus. They saw him stop the storm. They saw him feed the 5,000. They saw him instantly moved them from point A to point B. They knew who he was. Okay, God, hey, do we get to call fire out of heaven now? You told us we have all this power. Can we call fire down and just eat them up and just burn them up? And that's the way we are today too often. Somebody stands against us and the immediate thing we say is, let's call fire down to heaven and consume them. And come on, God, let's get us over with. Man, man, if we did that, everybody would feel... But that's not the way God does things. And that's when he told him, I didn't come here to kill people. I came here to save people. And we, you know, in churches, we had a, we went out to lunch, Pastor and Craig and, and uh, Luis. And, and, you know, we were having lunch Sunday. We were talking about some ministerial things and things we wanted to do here. Kind of, the pastor was kind of feeling everybody's feelings, you know, and it was a great meeting. <clears throat> but one of the things that came out of that was, you know, we're not all alike. We may all have different ideas about some things. Mm -hmm. Pastor and I don't agree on everything. Craig and I are not going to agree on everything. Craig and Pastor are not going to agree. And, and Luis, he's not going to agree with us either on every little detail. But that doesn't mean because we don't agree that I should say, okay, God, just call fire out and just wipe them out. Or, or pastor, ah, throw these guys out of the church. But we want to do that. We think we are so much smarter than everybody else that if they don't see it my way, wow, you're just all a bunch of you know, imbeciles. You're just all, you're just all ungodly. You're all just in this for your own stuff. And it's not that way at all. The older I get, the more I study, the more I find out that all the stuff that I thought was so really important is really not important at all. It all amounts down to my, my opinion. And what I think doesn't mean to help beings. I'm not going to change God. I'm not going to change the course that God has laid out. All I'm going to be able to do is to have my personal opinion about that. And we need to understand that while we may have other churches, we shouldn't call fire down on some other denomination out here just because they don't see things the way we see them. But we want to do that. We, 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 that's our nature. But we need to remember that Jesus came to save. And we're better off to show love. We're better off to get with them, to sit down with them, and to be able to impart with them to them a better way. 
Not the perfect way, because we may not understand it perfectly, but it is a better way. And we need to take that concept and put it to our lives. This is why that section, I think, is in here. We need to understand we can't just be 100% right on everything. Now, here they were. They, they left the city, went to another little village. Evidently, they were accepted there, spent the night, got food and whatever, went across the Jordan River, traveled down the western side until they got down to Judah, and then they crossed back over Jordan. And when they crossed over Jordan, there was great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Notice the other one. Uh, great multitudes followed him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. So here he was doing exactly what he had always done, only now he's in Judea. Multitudes, teaching, healing, moving down, headed for Jerusalem. And now we come to the next number three event, and that's an important lesson in consecration. Luke 9, 57 to 62. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Whoa, pretty strong stuff here. You know? I mean, when we look at this, I mean, you know, here, here's a guy, his dad has just died. Evidently, he just died. And, and here is somebody who's probably earnest. Oh, Lord, I'll follow you. Wherever you go. He's been hearing the teaching. He's seen the miracles. He's charged up. Oh, yeah, man, yeah, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And look at the response that he said. Hmm. You really want to follow me wherever I go? Well, foxes have holes and even birds have nests, but I don't even have any place to lay my head. Now, we understand, you know, that he wasn't just talking about in the physical world because he had a house. He was in it, in Nazareth. He had a mother. He had a place. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't that he didn't have a house. But when he was traveling, he didn't. He traveled from town to town, village to village. Uh, maybe he would sleep under the stars some nights. Of course, in those days, they did. And of course, it's hot over there, so you didn't necessarily need to have a place to sleep. You just pulled up someplace and covered yourself with your mantle and went to sleep. You know, they were, that was the way they, they lived. Uh, and they still do in parts of, of that part of the world. But he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Now there's some that say this would be, uh, this was probably somebody who was rather wealthy. We'd gone, we're in Judea now. We're over here on the other side of the tracks where people are affluent. So this could well have been somebody who's got lots of, of, of material things. You remember there was the other man who came to Jesus, and 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 you know, and he says, you know, I, I want to follow you. And anybody says, well, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the guy couldn't do it because he had so much wealth he couldn't sell it. So we may have had somebody else in that position that was wealthy or at least had a lot of goods. Jesus saying, I don't even have a place to lift it in my head. You sure you want to follow me? Now, we don't know whether the guy did or didn't. We don't know. But we do know that he looked at somebody else and said, follow me. And the second guy, he says, well, 
Uh, you know, I would, uh, but boy, you know, I gotta go bury my father. I'm in mourning. Now, you know, we look at that as he's gonna run home, throw him in a tomb, roll the thing, the stone in front of it, and come charging back. But this, this took a lot of planning because this was a big festival when somebody died. You know, they had to hire the mourners and they had to cry for so many days. And you had to have food for all the relatives and friends that would come in. And it was a big deal when somebody died. And then they had a parade, you know, of all these mourners and everybody to go to the tomb. All this had to be planned. So this guy is saying, man, i got to bury my dead. I, 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 I would, I, man, I'd be right there, but i got to go bury my dead. Jesus makes a startling statement. He said, let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me and preach the gospel. Wow. Jesus, what are you talking about? Let the dead bury the dead. Hmm. We have to look at these things and understand, number one, that consecration cannot be made on the basis of emotion. You know, we don't have revival services. We used to have revival services. You probably remember something. We used to have a revival service. I mean, they would go on, you know, for a week or two, three sometimes. Every night, man, it was supercharged. I mean, it was revival services, and man, everything was pumped up, and whoa, you know, it was great. We'd go to camp meetings, and, oh man, youth camps, and, wow, they were pumped up and great. And man, everybody would make consecration. Oh yeah, man, the altars would be full of people making consecrations. And three weeks later, you didn't find but maybe a handful of them still in church, or, or at least, you know, still doing anything. Because we can't make consecration based on our emotions. It, Jesus, uh, he told the story, the parable, he said, you know, a builder, who's going to build a house, he doesn't go out and build a house until he first finds out what the cost is. Until you come to the realization of what it's going to cost to consecrate and to follow him, you cannot be successful in that consecration. And this is, where, this is what people don't want to do. You know, they don't really want to look at the side that says, what's it going to cost me? But, but it, this is just the normal law of life. I mean, you can't go down to the Cadillac dealer and say, hey, I want that Cadillac right now. Where's the papers? I'll sign it. I, I drove it. I want it right now. Right now. Well, it's going to cost you $1,000 a month in car payments. Can you afford that? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I want it right now. And then they're ready to sign papers. And six months later, the tow truck pulls up and hauls the thing back. And you didn't have money to pay for it. Well, that's the way it is when we live for God. We have to understand that it costs. There is a price for following Jesus. It's not free. Salvation is free in the sense that we don't have to do anything to obtain salvation. But when it comes to following him, there is a cost. I, I don't know, almost every church I've been in where we've had young men, you know, at some point they all think they're called to preach. Oh yeah, I'm called to preach. I am going to be the world's best preacher. And, you know, they, they get to be around 17 or 18. Hey, pastor, can, can you set me up? I want to preach. I want to go out. Can you find one of your pastor friends? Man, I want to come hold a revival. And so they go off to... And then, of course, pastor's been around a while. They call a friend up and say, hey, I got this young buck over here that wants to go. You, you got a, something he ought to use revival or something he can come over and preach for you. you know? <laughs> I know, I've been there, okay, and my dad, I mean, you know, we've been there. And sure enough, they come over, and sure enough, man, at the end of the revival, they come back to church, and they look like a whipped puppy. Man, nobody did anything, and nobody, did, and it was terrible, and I was really anointed, you know. And then you, you locked them, and they had a five minute sermon that didn't say anything because they never spent the time to put the sermon together. You know, you, you can't just sit down and pick up the Bible and walk off and preach a sermon. 
Now, I can do it probably, and Rick might be able to do it, and Craig, you know, we've been around a while. We preached a few sermons, and, and we know the scriptures enough that we can, I can, just give me five minutes, yeah, I can preach a sermon, probably go 20 minutes. You know, maybe I can go an hour, depending on what it is. But, but the, the new kid's starting now, he, he can't do that. Because he hasn't put the hours into study and research and prayer and, and just dedicated himself to that while everybody else is doing something else. You have to dedicate and take that time in order to be, to be good at that. If, if you're going to be a, a, a world-class pianist, you, you don't get that by, by going and taking piano lessons once a week. It takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of practice. I was watching a PBS the other night. I, I like jazz. I, I, I like a lot of the different kinds of the, the smooth jazz stuff. And one of the guys, Chris Bodie, is a trumpet player. And uh, I mean, he is fantastic. He was with the Boston Pops Orchestra and they had this jazz night. They had all these different people coming in. But he was talking, he said, somebody asked him, how do, how do you get to be so good? And he says, they got four things. Practice, 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 and no sting. And, and that, was, that was kind of funny. Everybody started laughing. But the point is, uh, Sting is a, a, I don't know, he's a well-known vocalist. He's rock and he's jazz. And anyway, he kind of, anyway, somebody you need to know if you're in the business. But it was kind of funny. But the point is, it was practice. It was putting the time in while other people are doing other things. And when you find somebody that, that does that, there was a young lady who came on and played the violin. And I, I played violin for a while when I was four years old. You know. But <clears throat> she was playing that violin. I heard a lot of violin players. Um, I love to hear good violin players. Uh, you get some classical work, you know, Ixop Ravine, and he plays, and it's just, oh, it's amazing. This, this gal got up there and started playing, and it was just different. And it was simple. It wasn't really difficult fingering, but the tone and the way that she pulled the bow and, and the, just the pressure on the strings, and, and it just came alive. And, and the whole, they just thought the whole violin was just alive and part of her. But, but she spent hours and years and years working on it. Well, that's what we need to apply to working for God. People want to work for God, fine. Consecrate your life, fine. But understand, it's going to take some time. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take doing that instead of doing other things. It takes focusing yourself on the things of God and not on other things. The man said, I've got to bury my dad. Following Christ requires that our priorities are right. Right priorities. Let the dead bury the dead. We have to save those that are alive. That's what Jesus was saying. Let the dead bury the dead. You come and preach the gospel. They're dead. You can't help him. It doesn't matter how, how elaborate the funeral is. doesn't matter. It's not going to affect anything. He's dead. But we got a world out here that needs to be saved. That's where the focus has to be. That's where the priority has to be. And you need to drop what you're doing and follow me. The third man, he needed to go say goodbye to everybody. Oh, I'll follow you, but, but, but I have to go say goodbye. <laughs> Following Christ requires a decision and a complete alliance to that decision. That means, you know, yeah, but, but you know, I'm, I, I would love to come along, but, you know, I, some other things that I've got to take care of. I want to make that decision. I, I understand it's going to cost some things. Uh, it's going to cost my family and stuff, but, but, but I'm going to have to go say goodbye before. 
an alliance, what I mean by an alliance to that decision, means once you have made that decision, it becomes a part of you. It becomes your primary point that you're doing in your life. That decision. When we make a decision to serve Jesus, when we make a decision to be saved, that has to be something that now is paramount in our lives. It becomes welted right onto us. We become merged with it, and that decision becomes a part of us. It's not a matter of saying, well, I want to serve God, but I'm going to go back over here to my tavern and have one last drink. I've got to go over here and do one more thing. I gotta go say goodbye to everybody. Pat them on the back, cry and say, Oh, I'm gonna go serve God now, and I'm gonna leave. No. Make the decision and move on that decision. Now we have some great examples. Well, and Jesus went on to say here. And he said, he said, it's it, it's it's the guy who's plowing the field. If you're gonna go out there and plow the field, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're going to start off, you're going to make the decision, and you're going to work for God, and you're going to live for God, and you're constantly looking back at where you have been, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. Lot's wife is a perfect example. Here they are fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, the whole place is being destroyed, and she has to have one more look. It didn't say she wanted to turn around and run back. She just wanted one glimpse at where she'd come from. One more time to think about how great it was in Sodom. When we turn to serve God, we cannot afford to look back. Oh, I remember how good that was. Oh, I can still feel that. I can still taste that. I, I, if you do that, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, we had some, some wonderful examples in the disciples. You remember when Jesus called the disciples? He's walking down by the seashore, and he, all he said was, come follow me. Now, he hadn't done anything yet. He had no reputation. And what did they do? Threw down their nets and followed him. Now, James and John and, and Peter, they were in business with, 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 uh, with, uh, with their father. I mean, James and John's father. They were in business. They had a fishing business. They had servants. So, so they had a big fishing business. You would think they would say, Jesus, just a minute, we gotta go, I gotta go sign some papers. Just a minute, Jesus, I gotta make sure everybody knows, you know, we're gonna be gone, so my father's gotta take over. No. Oh. They just threw down their nets and took off. That's the way he wants us to be. Throw down our nets and follow him. Alright. So <clears throat> Now we come to the last uh, event that we're going to talk about tonight. So while Jesus is on the road, while he's healing, while he's doing the things that he's doing, the festival starts in Jerusalem. And so now we have various opinions about Jesus that are expressed at the feast before he has arrived there. And we find that in John chapter 7, verses 11 to 13. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among, among the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, Festival has started. They've already had the day of, of Sabbath. Well, they're probably in the second or third day of the feast now. And, uh, you know, everybody's celebrating. You know, there's parties going on all over town. Uh, things happening. And 
Jesus hadn't been there in 18 months, so he's already missed the other feast. So there are people already saying, you know, this guy's violating the law, or at least the spirit of the law, because he hasn't been here for the other feast he was supposed to come to. We've been looking for, we've been hearing about him. He's, he's doing all these miracles and doing all this teaching, and we've heard about it, but he's not here. Some possibly had been to Galilee or were from, from Galilee. A lot of the Jews were there because they all made the pilgrimage, right? So you probably had the ones from Galilee or saying, saying, no, this guy is doing miraculous. And man, you ought to see what he's doing. Maybe somebody said, man, I was in that crowd, 5,000, and they just broke bread and kept breaking it. We ate. And, and somebody, oh, wow, you know, it was my daughter that was healed, my son, or I was healed. You can, you know, you hear that. Then you got the others, and they're, they're sitting over there, you know, well, it can't be a God, you know, I don't, if I don't see it, it ain't no God. How many times you got people like that in church? So we had this big confusion going on. They're all arguing. But in this, we start to see the people become polarized. Those who were for Jesus, those who were not. <clears throat> and this is going to play a big part in just a few months when he's hauled in before Pilate. <clears throat> because I think this explains, you've you heard a lot of people say, well, so many people follow Jesus, but then at the crucifixion, they all turned their backs and walked off. That's probably true to some degree. But there weren't necessarily those that had seen the miracles of Jesus who changed their mind and started hollering, crucify. Because you already had a large group of people that were against him. They were the Orthodox Jews. They were the ones who you, you know, you, you, you could blow them off center with a stick of dynamite. They're going to stay where they are. And unless they could see this stuff and it happened to them, they didn't believe. And so you see this polarization. And notice this last part. He said, however, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Um, those who believed in him, they did not speak, what this means is, did not speak boldly about him. And the reason is they feared the Jewish rulers. So you weren't going to have that person who's jumping up and down and ready to, you know, grab a whole bunch of people and go out there and, ah, we're out in the street quarters and preaching about Jesus and how good he is because they feared the Jewish rulers. So there was automatically this polarization, and then on top of that, you had this Jewish authority that was pushing down those that believed in him. So when it came time for the trial, what you had in the trial in front of Pontius were all of them that didn't believe in him, and those that did believe were so browbeaten that they were taken out of the way. His enemies were not silent, but his friends had no confidence to speak of him openly or boldly. That is, to speak what they really thought. Many supposed that he was the Messiah, yet even this they did not dare to profess. All that they could say in his favor was that he was a good man. There are always many such friends of Jesus in the world who are desirous of saying something good about him, but who, from fear or shame, refuse to make a full acknowledgment of him. Many will praise his morals, his precepts, and his holy life while they are ashamed to speak of his divinity or his atonement and still more to acknowledge that they are, de they are dependent upon him for salvation. Any questions? All right, we've got uh, two more weeks. Uh, unless uh, I mentioned that I'm going to ask Craig if he would like to come and, and uh, teach for five weeks. I don't know whether he will. Uh, I'm call and see if he's interested. So if we do, I'll let you know. Um, I, I kind of doubt it because of his schedule, but he might.
All right, that's it. Two more weeks. Thank you.